Tom with us today to speak about the contemporary threats to higher education, a topic of primary interest to faculty and uh, to students. Um, this talk is sponsored by the Bridging Cultures Project here at CCM, which is dedicated to infusing themes of democracy and diversity into humanities course curricula by CCM's Diversity Committee and CCM's Legacy Project. Um, as each of these projects are firmly committed to the goal of educating diverse students to define and construct a vibrant and active democratic society as a committed and active citizen. America used to have the best colleges and universities in the world. Since the end of World War II, when the GI Bill, the SAT, and FHA loans made colleges and universities more open, these institutions helped create a robust post-war middle class. They provided a public space for democratic discourse. They educated and informed citizenry. And while many were left out in the post-World War II period, African Americans, Latinos, women, still, in the mid-20th century, higher education was a public good. In addition, community colleges created in the 1960s added considerably to an open system of higher education. The community college was created as a dynamic and diverse public space and center for the community. The community college movement in the 1960s was a movement full of promise. It included a vision of greater equity in higher education, a dedication of faculty to the mission of teaching, and the creation of a non-traditional educational institution often with strong ties to the surrounding community. community. Those rich democratic traditions are a part of our community college heritage. But today, this tradition of democracy, possibilities, and creativity is severely threatened. The community college system, and in fact our entire system of higher education, is currently under fierce attack. As students graduating from college with higher and higher burdens of student loan debt, and as faculty confronting the undermining of job security, academic freedom, and support for creative and committed teaching and research, we should all be highly concerned about this. We are quite privileged today to have Michael Fabricon here to speak with us about this issue. Mike is not only a much published scholar, his most recent works include Charter Schools and the Corporate Makeover of Public Education with Michelle Fine, published in 2012, The Changing Politics of Education, Privatization, and the Dispossessed Lives Left Behind with Michelle Fine in 2013. Um, he's currently working on a book related to the material that he will speak with us about today entitled Austerity Blues, Fighting for the Soul of Public Education with Steve Breyer. Uh, and those are just a few of his many, many, many publications. But in addition to his scholarship, Michael is a committed activist. Um, he has long been a principal officer in CUNY's faculty and staff union, a union of 27,000 strong. Uh, for the past eight years, he's been doing that. And he's also done a great deal of important work on homelessness in the United States. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Michael Fabricon. I'm gonna, I guess I'll talk from here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And what I want to begin with is uh, saying that sort of to s the, the hope of community colleges and public higher education historically to sort of very powerfully affirm, or as powerfully as I can, what Jill said earlier, uh, was part of the great hope, the post-World War hope, really, of America. But that hope was not realized as part of an abstraction. It, that hope was realized from the 30s through the 70s, really, in great part because there were very strong movements pushing for the kind of access and investment that public higher education represented nationally. And I want to sort of stay with that. Uh, I mean, I'm going to stay with it uh, through this presentation to the very end, that nothing is really possible without some form of, of, of organized political effort to make it happen. 
Public education happened in part because it contributed to the economic development of the country, but it also happened more largely because substantial and powerful groups of people organized to make it happen. Uh, there hasn't been a public service in this country that's ever uh, emerged and become a part of the apparatus of uh, federal or state government without that movement push uh, to make it happen. So I'm uh, going to shut this off. Um, what I want to talk about in the beginning is this sort of sense of crisis that pervades uh, policy making in this country presently. Um, in K, and I'm going to talk uh, in a back and forth between K through 12 is almost a stereo system between K through 12 and public higher education. What is beginning to happen in public higher education is already well underway in K through 12. And this is not an accident um, and it's not a conspiracy. It is part of a complex set of social factors that are producing change, uh, rapid uh, change within public institutions. What is the crisis? In K through 12, there was an assumption and an empirical reality that the test scores of students were insufficiently high. Uh, that in fact what we had internationally were relatively low test scores as compared to Western Europe and Asia. And that there was a racial gap and a class gap in conjunction with those test scores which then promoted a sense of crisis within public education K through 12. It's important, I would think, at the outset to say that the crisis, and what very few people talk about in relationship to policy, was very much a class-specific crisis, if a crisis existed. What do I mean by that? When you look at the top 10, 10 to 20 percent of American students based upon income in K through 12, they placed where American students had historically placed internationally, right? And this is based, again, on income and wealth. They placed first in reading, second in science, and second, I believe, in math internationally. It's when you began to drill down to poor communities and poor students that the test scores then began to lag dramatically. Uh, internationally. So, I mean, that would tell us that there is some relationship between, the, between this question of poverty and income, inversely income, and the outcomes on these tests. Not anything that should surprise us, but in fact, as the policies were developed in K through 12, they became a no excuse policy and a no investment, new investment policy. Fundamentally, what the policy became in K through 12 was that we are going to uh, uh, focus and frame our reform on the basis of metrics, testing, and test scores. We are going to assess our teachers based upon those test scores and then therefore revamp curriculum on the basis of what needs to be done in order to improve those test scores. We are not necessarily going to make new investments. What we're going to do is produce new structural kinds of interventions that will provide more for less in relationship to the question of K through 12 public higher education. What do I mean by that? We produce charter schools, for example, as a way of improving test scores and make them more market-like. And the presumption is, to the extent that they're deregulated, flexible, offer new opportunities for reinventing public education, that in fact we can take the money that's already being invested, make it work harder, and produce better test scores as a result. That was the promise of charter schooling, right? driven by metrics driven by testing, and driven by crisis. It's important to understand that crisis is some part of what drives these changes, these rapid changes. Interestingly, though, in the 60s, when the racial gap existed just as profoundly, uh, essentially, as it does today, and the class gap, it was not seen as a crisis. It was seen as a crisis to the point at which the international comparisons became ever more troubling and the w political will, really, to invest in a public sector was began to uh, diminish. So what we have, then, is a circumstance where metrics are produced as a response to the crisis. Structures are produced, but no new public investment. And the reason that there's no new public investment are t is twofold. The first is that there's no new public investment because we can do more with less with more market-like 
institutions and responses to the problem. And the second is the cupboard is bare. What we have is a public sector in deep, deep deficit. We are not able to make the kinds of investments that historically have been made in relationship to uh, public institutions. I'd argue that um, on the first question about market, we'll get to in a moment. On the second question, which I'm not going to come back to, on the question of taxation, the cupboard is bare on the basis of present tax policy. But what nobody talks about is a revamping of that tax policy. And I just give you two examples and then move on. The tax structure for the federal government has become increasingly regressive over a, an essentially 35-year period, or since 1980. Less and less redistributive, um, more in fact uh, uh, redistributive, if anything, upward, not down. If one were to take the federal deficit today, one looked at all the income foregone on the basis of the new tax policies over the last 35 years, and those tax policies had prevailed over the subsequent 35 years, we would have no deficit. The federal government would have no deficit. That the, the deficit of the federal government is largely driven by the reconfiguration of the tax code. The same is true in New York State. I can't speak to New Jersey, but the same is true in New York State where the tax codes have uh, been converted in very similar fashion uh, happening maybe 25, 10 years later. So the money is there depending upon the political will. Who's going to get taxed and taxed for what and to the extent to which there's a social compact regarding these public institutions. There was no political will in 1930 necessarily right after the Depression to reinvent public institutions or expand them. The political will emerged as movements emerged in order to press for redistributive policies to promote and develop public institutions. Now, what does this mean for public higher education? Well, to begin with, if you're in a box in which fundamentally what you're saying is there's no new money, right? There's no new money on the one hand. And on the other, what you're saying is that we're going to now have metrics, and we'll get to that for higher education in a moment because the Obama rating system is, will drive uh, the rating systems and the metrics for public higher education. What you're left with is a circumstance in which you have austerity policy on the one hand, because there's no new money. Now, what does that mean? What it means very concretely is that over the last 10 years, public investment in public higher education has dropped by about approximately 50%. The public investment in public higher, public investment in public higher education has dropped by 50% over the last 10, 10 to 15 years. Concretely, just to give you an example of what that means, in Oregon, less than 10% of the budget of Oregon uh, State is public money. University of Minnesota, less than 10% of the money of the operating budget of the University of Minnesota is public money. Well, where is that money? Where, where, who's paying for it then? Who's paying for these institutions? Do we have any students here? You want to put your hands up? You're paying for it. It's increased tuition that's paying largely f and making up for the money that the public sector is no longer investing in public higher education. Now, what's the consequence for students? The consequence for students is that if for the institutions to stay afloat, they have had to increase tuition on the one hand, right? Has tuition increased here? I know it has in New York. And on the other, increase the census of students. I hear that your census of students has not grown. But across the country, the census of students has. Um, we're about to hit a demographic blip, which is going to have consequence. But up until, over the last 10, 12 years, the, the numbers of students have expanded. At CUNY, where I teach, over a seven-year period, approximate seven-year period, has gone from 220,000 students to approximately 270,000. That's a 50,000 student increase. Uh, with very little comparable, in fact, co accompanied by $500 million over a five-year period cut in the public budget. How many students here have experienced increased debt? 
You got students that are carrying across the country increased debt in order to pay for that increased tuition. So much so that we have a trillion dollars in debt now that students are carrying and some part of the campaign now that students have begin to, begun to develop is to avoid the second trillion uh, dollars of debt. Now, who and what is, blame, what is driving then reform in public higher education? What's driving reform in public higher education are two things. The first is student debt, right? Middle class, other poor parents are saying, we can't, it's unaffordable. We've got to tamp it down. The increases. But on the other hand, you've got universities that are struggling because they don't have the money because there's been this public disinvestment of approximately 50%. Where are the resources supposed to come from in order to sustain the public colleges and universities if not from tuition? So that's one part of the crisis that the Obama administration, and rightfully is pointing out, is that what is unfortunate, or more than unfortunate, is the source of the problem is not being identified, which are the public budget cuts. Two, students, particularly in community colleges, but also in senior, are not seen as progressing to graduation quickly enough. Right? There is a sense that students should be moving to graduation more quickly, and that these graduation rates are unacceptable. That's the second metric, right? Debt, movement to graduation. Now, of course, what's not a calculated into movement to graduation are all the external factors. Students who are here, how many of you work? Oh, almost every one of you. How many of you carrying more than one job? And juggling a full-time course load at the same time? That's not what it was 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 perhaps. The calculus has changed, and to the extent that that calculus has changed, it has had consequence for the movement of students rapidly to graduation. If I'm working two jobs, and maybe I do move as rapidly to graduation, but what I can extract from that experience is going to be very different if I'm working two or three jobs. I remember when I went to college, and I grew up poor. But I had an uncle and aunt who took me in, said you go to college, and my part of the bargain was I had to work five months over the summer, and I got a job working five months over the summer, and it took me through with student loans that were low interest to be able to uh, make it through, and the tuition was $1,600 a year. Now that's in earlier dollars, but even if we account for all of the changes in the value of those dollars, it doesn't likely uh, rise to the level of what you're paying. And I was able to work over summer and pay for everything else. That doesn't exist necessarily either, because the nature of jobs and the more job market has changed, and I'm not going to tread there either. But those two factors then become factors as we're looking at the ratings for the university. And the Obama rating plan is going to look at movement of graduation, student debt, jobs that students get. So the school will be assessed as teachers in K through 12 are assessed on the test scores for students, which by the way produces disincentives for students to teach in the poorest communities. I mean that data is out there because why would I want to be assessed for around test scores and then teach in a poor community. I have my whole career hinge on the fact that the test score is going to go up always more slowly in poorest communities. The, empir the empirical data verifies that pretty consistently. I'm not going to make my bet there, even though that may have been something I wanted to do. So what we've got is a circumstance here where you're, as a college, going to be also assessed on what jobs your graduates get. Of course, you have great control over that. Right, is you have great control over the economy and the kinds of jobs that are being created. You have great control over student debt, certainly you do, to the extent that you are now in a period of austerity where your dollars are being reduced and you're raising tuition really in many instances just to keep things afloat. And you have great control as a college over students moving toward graduation, of course you do, because you're going to be able to subsidize students in ways that they no longer have to work so that they can move toward graduation more quickly. 
The fact that you haven't got the resources to do that, and you're going to be judged upon factors that really do not, are not areas where, which, um, or factors or variables you, that a college has much control over, particularly public universities. So then, here we, ha there we have is the metric mix, and there are more factors of this kind, I'm naming three, that public colleges will be judged upon. The crisis, again, is graduation, and the crisis is uh, debt. The fact that public universities and education, more generally higher education, is revered across the globe, American higher education is revered across the globe as one of perhaps the single most important contributions and innovations and quality products, if you will, I don't like using that language around a public good, but we'll use it in any event here for this moment, products of uh, the American experience, despite that, we're going to get a bearing down on public higher education, both in the cuts on the one hand and um, on the other, the uh, effort to, through metrics, measure what is a successful uh, public institution. So how is it that public higher education is going to survive in a circumstance of this kind? That's the question, isn't it? I mean, federal government's bearing down. Students are taking on more debt. There's, there's a threshold point around debt, uh, more so for private than for public, but for all. Uh, movement toward graduation, which is going to be a criterion, is a, is a difficult thing to achieve, given all these external variables. Well, let's talk about technology as the opiate uh, for this particular set of conditions. What do I mean by technology? How do you reduce the cost of learning? I think you probably have the answer to that question. I can cheapen the cost of learning if I can teach more students in a classroom with fewer faculty. The largest cost I've got if, if I'm managing or administering a university is my faculty. That's, it's true not only of universities, it's true anywhere. Labor costs are most expensive. New technologies are being created presently to, in fact, not necessarily, but are being created to potent, possibly supplant faculty and have the technology itself both deliver content with a faculty member but fewer to deliver the content. In fact, for content to be constructed as a fit with that technology, all right, and that will in turn reduce the per student cost associated with the uh, experience itself. So if I, have, if I can reach 3,000 students through virtual forms of technology, or 1,000 or 500, and I can reach them in places I may not have been able to reach at other points in time, then in fact, and I have one faculty member with maybe a little bit of support essentially producing that, my per my labor costs are decline, I can sustain my student expense, uh, my uh, tuition, and the university becomes, again, solvent. Does that sound like a familiar model? That's exactly what the for-profit industry in, public, in higher education has done. They have reduced the cost by effectively, that's what Phoenix does, all right? You can go from Phoenix University to Capella, we can go right across the whole continuum. In fact, the New York Times has a, an op-ed, a uh, editorial today on uh, for-profit higher education institutions. It's predatory because the graduation rates are so low. Um, that in fact what we have is a circumstance here in which you transmit virtually, you offer minimal amounts of support, to students who are often most academically challenged, and all the empirical data indicates that online learning, although it may benefit certain groups of students, is most detrimental as part of an experience to the most, to the to relatively academically challenged. Why? Because they're the students who require most mentoring, confident, all the confidence, all the things necessary to move students forward in a learning process and move them to certain levels of academic capacity and competence. That's where the disproportionate failure occurs in online learning. That was the experience in California at San Jose University. Sebastian Thurn, who's the CEO of Udaxity, understood that after his experiment at San Jose University and said from this point forward, he's moving to hybrid courses, which are join 
faculty with the virtual learning because uh, the more you, the virtual learning more largely uh, without that kind of uh, in classroom experience was more troubling to him. So that's one way. That's not to say that Capella, Phoenix only offer those courses, right, online, but they disproportionately offer it, and it's a way to reduce costs. It is a way also to reduce costs within public higher education, and to the extent that there's a squeeze play on in terms of financing, it will be one of the ways to reduce debt on the one hand, hold tuition steady, and on the other to move students potentially to graduation, possibly. Although the uh, higher education, the uh, for-profits not encouraging their record of moving people. Nine percent, I believe, or six to nine percent graduate within five years. Um, the, 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 the numbers are very, very low. So, uh, as well, how do we do this? We streamline curriculum. Right, I, at CUNY right now, we have something called Pathways. What is Pathways? And uh, by the way, I could talk about any, uh, this is a, a, an approach in a number of different universities. Pathways is a curriculum. Science, your lab's taken away. How many of you students are taking, how many of you are taking science courses? You have any labs? All right. At CUNY, for the base, they're taking the labs away. They've severed the lab from the, uh, from the uh, science course. It's not transferable anywhere else. Most, no, mo, uh, mo, but if I've created a template of three credit courses to move students through more quickly and make the curriculum more uniform across the university, and by the way, that's part of the effort, is to standardize to the extent that we, that's what testing is about in the K-12. If I can standardize my test my outcome, which is a test score, and I can standardize my curriculum in order to produce it, then I can, in effect, create a different kind of curriculum that's organized around this kind of more, is more uniform and standardized experience. I can cheapen to some extent through virtual and even on the education on the labor side, the people who are teaching it, I can cheapen the costs associated with the hiring and the employment and the delivery of the content. And that's precisely what's happening in some parts of K through 12. This then lends itself to a certain kind of standardization. If I move toward curricula where every course has to be three credits, every course then has to meet certain kind of criterion. What, what does that mean for English composition at Pathways uh, at uh, CUNY? It used to be four credits. What was the fourth credit for? It was for writing and composition and development of capacity around it. That's been taken away. Now we're back to three credits and the capacity of teachers or instructors to teach to the writing in a circumstance where they have 30 students and they're only getting three credits has been diminished. Is that clear? So there's a diminishment of quality. When you move towards standardization of the kinds that I'm describing, what we do is we dilute the quality of the experience, particularly in a complex experience such as education. And here I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to go out on a limb. In my estimation, what distinguishes most public goods, but particularly education, is the relationship between the person providing the service and the person who is on the other end and receiving it, or in exchange with it. To the extent that a relationship is built in education, the opportunities for growth capacity development is enlarged. Right? If I can build a relationship with you in relationship in conjunction with the material, and I can, in fact, promote a learning experience that, in my estimation, is a more powerful change-driven uh, 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 experience that, when I say change-driven, that the academic development of the student is enlarged. To the extent that I have autonomy and discretion in the classroom, and I can use my skills and knowledge in that classroom, and I'm really committed to that, I can promote that quality experience and those building of relationships. If I have 20 students in my class, I can do it better than if I have 30. And if I have four, 30 students in my class, I can do it better than if I have 40. And we can go on, and let the, unless I have all kinds of other supports. Fact is that as I move to standardization and enlarged classes, um, that is a cheapening on both ends, the, the opportunities for that kind of public good and that kind of quality and that kind of transformative experience, frankly, in a relationship to education is reduced. That's not to take out of the calculus 
that teachers run along a continuum too. Who can do this better? Who can do this less better? That's clear as well. But on the other hand, the probability of my being able to do it if I'm an extraordinary professor or a very good one with a class of 50 as opposed to 20 is diminished. And I, my capacity to do that, if I have to meet a test score and I don't have the discretion or autonomy to build a class around what I consider to be, based on my expertise in a university, the absolutely most important material to be taught and how pedagogically that needs to be taught is diminished as well. So, Standardization of curriculum, standardization of delivery systems. In the university, the replacement of full-time faculty with part-time, I don't think that that requires any further development. Anyone that teaches in a university understands how full-time faculty have, become, have been over a 20 to 30 year period, the proportion of the teaching faculty have been diminished. Part-time faculty have increased. What that meant has meant in terms of keeping public higher education afloat and frankly, what that's going to mean in the future to the extent that there are intensified fiscal pressures on uh, public higher education to even increase the number of part-time faculty. That's not to say that's going to happen, but again, to the extent that fiscal pressures and strains are increased. And CUNY is an example. In 1975, we had 11,000, or 74, we had 11,500 full-time faculty. At our lowest point in our trough, we had 5,400 full-time faculty. Today, we have 13,000 part-time. And we're up to about 7,500 full-time. Um, and I want to end with the, just these two quick points. Some part of this is about the monetization of education. What do I mean by that? Charter schooling is a, a, a hybrid set of schools, but about a third of those schools are for-profit institutions. That is, we can now take that money in the for-profit charters, and we're taking money from public sector, and we're putting it into, into quasi-public schools, and they are for-profit institutions. That's a, an interesting occurrence. For a charter school, I may be leasing my building. In some charter schools, up to 40% of the money that they've gotten from the public sector is dedicated to leasing uh, contracts. Well, somebody's making a lot of money on that, right? The people that are doing the leasing. And somebody's losing on that when 40% of the money automatically comes out of the classroom instructional budget. And that's not an anomaly. That happens more often than you would imagine. Virtual forms of technology and the platforms are a for-profit, by and large, project. Now, the Big Ten took the profit makers out of the equation by essentially saying, we're creating our own consortium, and we will uh, develop this technology on the basis of what's in the best interests of our schools and our students. But as pressure intensifies on public higher education, to what extent, we have to ask ourselves, does the pressure then uh, express itself in ways that for-profit companies, and it's happening, and I see it at Hunter College. We have every depart, we have uh, endowed chairs of, of, from Avon, and we have um, every bathroom and building, uh, and now uh, even places where folks are teaching marked with corporate uh, signifiers. Um, it's like a soccer player, you know, with all the different corporations on the chest. Um, the university is marked by these things as well. But that's the least of it. Mo the most has to do with ways in which, uh, for example, the New York Times reported that um, for-profit companies come into universities, make contributions, they always have, but now di dictate, because of the lack of public funds, what brain surgery is going to be done or not done based upon the predilections of uh, the giver, and then effect effectively driving the, the inquiry itself. Um, the virtual forms of technology, uh, by and large, if I'm a, a, a university looking to s make ends meet, I may be, there may be, there may, there's enormous incentivization potentially for me to let a for-profit company in to pay as a vendor to have uh, distribution rights regarding uh, the curriculum and the development. There, those fiscal pressures produce other kinds of possible outcomes other than what an educator or administrator might in, in their best moments see as, uh, as uh, something that's absolutely 
objectionable and not something they would capitulate to, but in a circumstance in which the money's not there to keep the doors open and the lights on, that well may be a bargain that is made, right? Because that pressure continues to mount. So, having said all that, talking about monetization, innovation, austerity, crisis, that's a pretty difficult picture. And yet, in this moment, there's great opportunity to begin, because technology, for example, is benign. Uh, technology is not a, you know, it's a, it can be a wonderfully useful, rich, supportive tool, or it can be a tool that drives a different kind of agenda that withers uh, quality in terms of education. What it becomes depends upon who controls the technology. Who controls it toward what ends? And that needs to be thought about, but that's a great opportunity to be in the middle of that debate and that discourse. Um, great opportunity now to begin to talk for faculty. What does it mean to, for there to be a democratic, universities were a historically democratic institution, as democratic as any institution has been. What does that, what does that mean? Governance structures had managed and control over curriculum, for example, right? We're the experts, we got our doctorates, we know chemistry, we know sociology, we know anthropology, we will shape the curriculum. We're in a moment right now, for example, at CUNY, where on the basis of litigation, the management has claimed the right through pathways to dictate how that curriculum is organized and filled. But that's a wonderful moment for faculty potentially to reassert in this, his, in, in this historic moment particularly, the democratic right and prerogative faculty to continue to preserve their relationship to that curriculum and quality. But it rubs up against the necessity for managers to figure out ways to streamline and to, and to reorganize based upon those fiscal realities. But there are two different sets of interests in this particular moment. And one, although keeping those lights on and keeping those doors open, Toward what end? What's the question around quality? What it is we're producing? The meaning of that education for folks? And here's the kicker. Are we preparing students from the colleges and K through 12 for the best paying jobs in the labor market? The best paying jobs, what do they demand? Critical thinking, writing skill, and we can go right on down the list. If our curriculum becomes less complex the capacity of students to fill those jobs is diminished. And finally, or right before finally, the question of race and class is never too far from this conversation. Who attends public universities? What are we preparing them for? And how is this being refigured as the market is refigured as well in relationship to that particular cohort of potential or prospective workers? If I said to someone shaping these policies, like an Arne Duncan, for example, and this is a cheap shot, but I'll do it anyway, you send your child to the public schools you're configuring in K through 12 in Bedford-Stuyvesant. You send your child to the public university that you're configuring on the basis of standardization and virtual delivery of technology and the austerity regimen. I suspect Arne Duncan would make the same choices he's made, which is to send his kids to private schools. And he sends his kids to those private schools for a reason, because they get an enriched, complex learning experience. The students in Bedford-Stuyvesant and at public universities deserve no less. This is about political will. And so what, and here to the final point. This is about a fight. And so this is a fight, the fight for the soul of public higher education, right? This is about a fight for the soul of public. What are people prepared to do as faculty and students in order to struggle, not individually, but collectively, to preserve the question is preserve quality and figure out ways to begin to mount and press because it's not enough to say, okay, we want quality and not be able to work on the other end toward the investment necessary to preserve it, right? 
there's an investment outside the university that's required in order to preserve it. And those issues, it seems to me, are profound and they're legacy issues. What do I mean by that? For students, faculty know, I would assume. But for students, you have sisters and brothers who are coming after you to this college who also want a college education, who are going to want to go on to senior colleges. What are you leaving behind? If you don't fight for quality now, what are you leaving behind for them? And for faculty, the same is true. It's a legacy issue. If you've put 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's not enough to watch it be diminished and simply say, I'm a caretaker doing the best I can to preserve. How do I begin to collectivize this in ways that we really try to make the case for and push for a different investment in public higher education? Because where we are right now is that the whole question of investment in public services has been so derogated, so critiqued, that there is been very little room to even have that conversation. And so what we look toward are market solutions, and what we look toward are ways in which we can create structural market solutions like charter schools as a solution to what are fundamentally investment issues uh, and ways of thinking strategically about those investments, particularly around matters of differential access and social class and so on, and what is available to folks who are coming into universities in this instance. So I'd ask you to think about that because all of this is political. All of this is political. It begins with the way in which you define a problem. Is the problem really student debt? Yes, of course that's a problem. Is the problem really movement to graduation? Of course that's a problem. Or is the problem, uh, if I reframe it, that we've disinvested so much in public higher education that students are forced to take on debt because the tuition's increased and because interest rates have gone up. Is it really movement to graduation? Or is the problem that we've made insufficient investment in mentoring, developing, and moving students to graduation because some of the co many of the college have been stripped so bare of those kinds of supports and that kind of capacity? We need to begin to reframe the problem, rethink the, because how we frame it has political implication. And then, and then the last finally, if I can define the problem in the way that it is being defined right now, no investment, no new investment, structural solution, who wins? I'd say that students don't win. I'd say faculty don't win. And I would say that the managers of public institutions trying to make them robust institutions don't win either. The people who win are people who can continue to tamp down the investment in public. How, how, how do they win? I pay lower taxes. Right? I pay lower taxes in relationship to a kind of social obligation regarding those institutions. That would demand progressive tax. Who wins? To the extent that I can move virtual forms of technology and profit-making institutions within, into public sector institutions, who wins? People making that profit. We need to look at who wins and who loses. That's a political question. So that's it. Uh, anything and <laughs> deal with questions, Q and A. Okay, so we have time for questions. Um, well, thank you very much. That was terrific. <coughs> it stimulated a lot of thoughts in my mind. I'm just going to try to think through two of them, <laughs> which is one. I think what's happening in higher education or public education in general is pretty much exactly what's happened in society overall, which is the growth of inequality, both economically and politically. And that inequality, one of the things it leads to is that the money holders, the purse holders in the society are making more and more of the decisions. They don't see public education as desirable from the point of view of that it should be an institution that does a public good. But often they see the institution as, like you said, for one thing, it, it causes their taxes to go up, <laughs> and that cuts into their wealth and income. But the other part of it is, is that a lot of public institutions are looked at as investment opportunities. So that I, I don't think a lot of the reform, both in K through 12, but also in higher ed, is so much due to people who 
are unfamiliar with education, how education works and what the real outcomes are, I think the education reform movement is largely driven by investment interests. Hence, you have the, the education alternatives, the Edison schools, management <coughs> and things like that. And I think that's also true in, in higher ed. And that's one of the things. So when we take on this problem, we're actually taking on a much bigger problem in society, which is that growth and inequality. The second point I, I wanted to make was that one of the responses, I think, for higher ed in regard to underfunding is that they then reach out to private interest and they all create a foundation to try to raise money. And, from, and, and one of the problems with that is then you get the donors deciding what parts of a school or a college are going to be emphasized and developed. For instance, at Montclair State, someone gave a huge donation and the college built a 500 seat year. Another developer gave a, a gigantic donation and they built and they created the John J. Cowley School of Music. Another donor gave a bunch of money <coughs> and an Italian cultural center was created. Another donor gave a bunch of money and there was an endowed chair created, I don't remember the department. So when the colleges are not being properly funded and they're supposed to be public institutions, they, although they're on the surface and name public institutions, they really become oriented or customized based on the whims or interests of some people who have a whole lot of money. I would just quickly respond. I mean, I, uh, to your second point, um, Look, the historic role of the state has been uh, in, a market, in a market economy uh, from the 30s through the 1970s has been, in part, it plays a strategic role around planning, right, for the whole, for the whole. That's what no individual corporation can do. It just can't. It's planning for its own individual corporate set of needs, most largely the next quarter in profit making. So it plans for the whole. Part of what you're saying is then it, that when that's taken away, then the, society, then the state can no longer do that, right? If it's that autonomy and money to do it. So that cuts across a lot of institutions. Let's take the environment, for instance, and deregulation. If, if I can't regulate private sector companies around environment um, to do strategic planning for short and long term and, and what we extract from uh, the environment, then in fact what I've got is a very destructive potential process that produces a lot of short-term gain in terms of profit and money for, for, for institutions, but all in the long haul has real consequence strategically in terms of what the society is going to be able to manage 30, 40, 50 years from now. The we can talk about infrastructure in the same way and so on. Of course it's true for universities. If I don't have the money to finance and there's no strategic direction and there's no dollars for it, then in fact the university is or college begins to expand willy-nilly based upon wherever the money may happen to be to create this building, that building. It's not necessarily part of an overarching strategic direction that's developed on the base of what students and faculty and the community need to move that university or that college forward into the next 10, 20 years. It's based upon what in fact is available through those private sources which may or may not fit comfortably with what would be a larger strategic plan. So I couldn't agree with you more but I think it's part of a larger set of dynamics. On the question of uh, um, for profit, you know the fact, going back to your first point, I think there are a variety of factors for profit and being one of them that influence the redirection. I mean look, let's face it, we went into 2008 there was a huge economic meltdown. And a lot of these trends have accelerated. They didn't begin. They were well underway. But they accelerated after 2008 in the economic meltdown. Why? Because a lot of companies are having a lot of difficulty earning their historic rates of profit. They just are. I mean, however we may want to sugarcoat that. Suddenly, you cast your gaze. You, the companies turn and they see, oh, wait a second. We've got a $600 billion invested in public education K through 12 and another $550 billion in public higher education. Here are new markets. And those markets now are being opened up to the uh, those pu the public sector, is that part of the public sector is being opened up 
That was already well underway in healthcare. Well underway in healthcare. What's happening in education follows what were already patterns that were set in other sectors. But that said, and that's transformative and important, I look at a guy like Bill Gates. I say, I think he's a complex guy. I think there are a variety of reasons he does this. And one of the reasons is he wants to do good. He wants to do social good. And we've got to give him that uh, and the foundation. That is real. And I think it's true for some of the hedge fund guys who do some of the stuff on charter schools. But then we need to look at the fact that a lot of the people giving the money today come out of t industries of technology. And the ways in which they see problems and solve problems has to do with the very worlds they come from. And the question is, can the imposition of that frame on a public good really work? And that's really the question of metrics, technology, and so on, as it, not an adjunct to, but a substitute for what historically public goods have, uh, have represented. And then, of course, of course, there's the profit. Other questions? Points. Don't you think that it's also a lack of respect for educators? I mean, you take a guy like Bill Gates, and I agree with you, I think that Bill Gates is a guy who genuinely wants to do good things. But rather than asking people who are professional educators how to reform things and how to make things better, he assumes that we don't know anything and is going to tell us how we should do our jobs. Right. And I don't know of any other profession in which people are, are, you know, do you go and tell doctors how to perform surgery? And the doctor will turn around and say, you know, but somehow we as educators have allowed ourselves to be superseded <coughs> by these, these people who really know nothing about what we do. I mean, that's an excellent point, and I, but I want to start with the fact that as faculty members, sometimes we do, I mean, I know I've been guilty of the same thing when I've gone into communities to work with homeless people. And I presume I know and they don't. And the whole sort of growth in that project is my f figuring out. They've got, they bring an enormous amount to the table around my knowing uh, about things I don't know. So there's hubris whenever we develop a body of expertise, clearly. And Bill Gates, ha you know, if you read Diane Va Ravitch's work and Reign of Error and her earlier, she talks about the kind of hubris of some of these folks. But I, I mean, yes, of course, that's there. Um, I suspect that, for, and, and also, by the way, for doctors, uh, it's not the way it used to be. It, in fact, the matter is that insurance companies are redefining the way in which doctors uh, organize their practices, what they can do and not do, how they do it, and so on. That's happening. It's sweeping right through medical care as well. But the foundations have played a very important role, and, and you put your finger on something very important. When you look at the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, and the Walton Foundations, and, and Lumina, add Lumina to that group, those foundations have played critical roles in defining the problem and financing solutions in relationship to their definition of problem. And it is always metric driven. It, it, they may consult with folks, but they're consulting with folks who basically sign off on their problem formulation and then impose that on institutions. That's not a formula, on the one hand, for really diagnosing what are the issues if, in fact, we look at this as a non-political and really a content issue. And it's also not a way to get professionals to own you know, the project in order to do the kinds of work necessary to improve what it is they do. But if you look at K through 12, a large part of what's going on right now in teaching, and there's been a decline to schools of education across the country, and the churning of teachers in urban areas is astronomical. In New York, every six years, 50% of the teachers churn, that is, they leave. And charter schools, KIPP, which is an exemplar, 15 to 40, uh, 20 to 40% a year who churn out. Part of what's going on when, is that you're talking about a deprofessionalization of professions. Let's be clear about that. Let's be clear about that. To the extent that I work with part-time faculty, right, as a major source of labor, as opposed to full-time, to the extent that they, uh, part-time faculty, have a job security vulnerability, to the extent that, uh, that that certainly can be part of a deprofessionalization. 
to the extent that I create forms of curriculum which no longer require the expertise of folks who've gotten their doctorates because I have prepackaged material in general education courses, which is the case in increasingly at, for example, CUNY, then I don't necessarily need people with doctorates with expertise. I'm deprofessionalizing that part of the profession. And what I'm doing simultaneously is cheapening the cost of labor, which brings us back to an earlier point. If I can cheapen the cost of labor in a period of fiscal crisis for the university because the public sector is pulling back, then I can keep the doors open and the lights on. And that's exactly how it's the lights and door, light doors have been open and the lights on. But if I can't do that, then I have a serious, particularly in public higher education, I have a serious problem in making ends meet. So the foundations have constructed a way of reimagining. And when Bill Gates was asked around K through 12, can you really provide what you're, can we provide the, I'm trying to get this right. This was like three years ago, this quote, um, when I read it. Essentially, he was being asked, what about the budget implications? Every state's cutting back on budgets, and you're, you're looking to hold teachers accountable in new, more stringent ways uh, regarding testing outcome. Can you really achieve this with all this budget cutback occurring? And he said, without a doubt. In effect, he ignored the budget cutback and moved to the technical side of the solution. And that's where the foundations are, and the consequences of that are enormous for workers, for public institutions, for the people who, can, who are consuming those public goods, and for the nature of what a public good becomes or can be. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm currently a student here. And um, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think the whole time how these kind of conversations aren't happening inside of classrooms. Um, and as a student, I think, and specifically think uh, talking to the students here, we need to make sure that we're also educating ourselves and questioning and critically thinking about the institutions that we're in. Um, because, of course, in some of these institutions, we're being taught ways in which we're going to maintain the system uh, already on how it is, not really challenging um, the system. And something you said, it really is political, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so on that note, just for the students that are here, um, we do need to organize ourselves. And right now, here currently in New Jersey, we have come together, uh, a, a few students, uh, more than a few, um, and we're starting a campaign called the NJ Health Campaign, which stands for New Jersey Higher Education Legislative Package. And we're really, we've been looking at existing bills um, that weren't introduced to any committees that all have to do with higher education and how to improve it, um, specifically. Um, and they really um, affect a really wide range of students. So uh, bills that have to do with EOF funding, uh, with transparency for financial aid for students, um, for uh, there's a tuition law bills. So we really have been looking at those and um, seeing who in our political world would be supportive of this because unfortunately that's how these changes are going to be made only if we go into the political world and understand that that's how that's being done. So this is like an extended invitation for students here um, who are interested in learning more about this and coming together um, to have these conversations. Just come talk to me after this. And thank you for sharing. Well, thank you. Uh, bravo uh, that you've gotten outside of that you've gotten outside of the specific experience to a larger experience and really trying to improve this, you know, the investment in this school and other schools and students. And what I would return to is you obviously understand the question of legacy, right? You've internalized it, you know? You're gonna be leaving here shortly, but you're still working and fighting for an investment in this community colleges and other uh, colleges across New Jersey. And that's a student responsibility to do, and that's a faculty responsibility to do. It's not enough uh, to basically sort of put our heads down and imagine it away. And I just want to, one point you made, accepting how it is, how it is is going to disappear, even today. 
there are forces driving change in relationship to public higher education. That's the point. That's the point here. Whatever legacy, and I think we can leave a quite substantial one behind, is going to be not only in stopping and rechanneling those forces, but as you are doing, to create something different. Um, and so I, I just want to say it's not static. It's not about how it is. It's about where it's headed. And we need to be very clear about that. The fight is about where it's headed and where we want to see it go. So thank you. I'd just like to add on that legacy issue that these students remember. It's not just your little brothers and sisters. You're the future mothers and fathers. The seeds that are being planted now, as Professor Fabricante talked about, this, these trends all started back in the 1980s, back in the 1990s. So the seeds that are being planted now are going to impact your children, your grandchildren, your community. So think about that also. Inspired. And what kind of education you want for your children? What kind of jobs you want for your children, as well as for yourselves and your brothers and sisters? I mean, that's all bundled up here because public higher education has been the gateway for that education and for those jobs, as you well know. And how do you do that in the midst of what we, you raised your hands around earlier? Many of you are carrying two, three, four jo two or three jobs. How do you incorporate that in a relationship to then having to work more in order to make this happen for you? Can you say anything about the role of the big textbook publishers in these sure. skills and their profession? And Absolutely. And <laughs> yes. Uh, and higher ed well, I, what I would say, I mean, look, we know. Uh, how many of you are paying more than $100 as students for textbooks? More than $200 for a single textbook. More than $300. It's like the drug companies. <laughs> right? I mean, there's some kind of conjunction here between the skyrocketing cost of these textbooks and ever more concentrated uh, influence of fewer and fewer <laughs> publishers in these industries. And perhaps the, most, the, the best example is Pearson's. Because not only is Pearson's doing the textbooks and trying to dominate markets, it has now moved into testing and data analysis and assessing. So not only are they developing the test, they are analyzing the test, and you know, they're reconfiguring the curriculum right now of student teaching. You, get, you create the test in K through 12, you analyze the data, you make the judgment based upon that data, which teachers are successful or not because of value-added measures and so on regarding teaching. Schools are now, schools of education are assessed on how well their teachers do relative to those test scores. I mean, it's even hard for me to describe, no less imagine it's three steps removed, but the schools will be graded on that basis. Well, what better group to go to than Pearson's to construct a curriculum now which is what's happening in schools of education to comport with the regimen of testing for, within the school. So teacher schools of education now are increasingly being asked to uh, participate in this new curriculum. And by the way, you can't, you are under, you have to sign off on their books and curriculum. You can't uh, migrate that curriculum anywhere else because it's owned by whom? Pearson's. So you don't get a textbook in that instance. You may get it locked in virtually and then coming back to the company because you can't move it. So yes. Other? What advice would you recommend for the new mayor of New York regarding the schools? What changes? Because you said that they'd be there for five years. Well, I mean, that's a good question for the new mayor for the Blasio. I mean, I think uh, he's doing some of it, he, but clearly, why do teachers leave? Why would you think teachers leave? That is how you students. Well, a lot of teachers know what students they're getting. It's just that when you have 40 difficult students in a class, it becomes impossible. So ratios are important. One of the things we found empirically is investment in the capacity of teachers is often found to be more important factor in terms of retention than even pay. So if I invest in you in terms of supervision and capacity development, 
more likely you will stay, uh, far more likely. Um, in fact, uh, there was an experiment of that kind up in the Bronx, and it was in the development of master teachers, and those master teachers in turn in, uh, in investing in public school teachers and their development. And the, uh, the outcomes were quite substantial and significant. So there are very clear ways in which you can stem the tide and in fact reverse it, but it all requires investment of one sort or another. And frankly, would, that would have to happen at the same time you're deprofessionalizing teaching, right? What's the single most important uh, factor in teacher development? Which group is generating the most publicity on teachers in public schools? Teach for America. What is the presumption of Teach for America? You take a kid from an Ivy League school, you throw them into a classroom, you, ho you hope they last two years, and then they move on to their real careers. If that's not a statement of deprofessionalization and derogation, really, as was pointed out earlier, of the profession of teaching, then I don't know what is. So we have to begin to replace those policies because there's a presumption at the bottom of this that continuity and expertise does not really matter. Continuity of experience in the classroom and expertise doesn't matter in terms of academic outcomes for students and complex learning. If we accept that, then we accept TFA. If we accept that, then we accept further and further removal through various forms of virtual and standardized curricula from the classroom. If we don't accept that, and we assume that some large part of what goes on has to, uh, that's effective has to do with skill, knowledge, and building relationships with students, then in fact that requires investment. And it requires it in the poorest communities disproportionately for any one of a variety of reasons. Uh, you're, talking about the, you're talking about the de-investment. From what I've read recently, and I'm sure you're probably more well versed in the studies I'm hearing comparing us to the rest of the world, the difference between our market orientation and like the Scandinavian countries, how they brought their education up was by focusing on the quality of the teacher and basically making teaching one of the most rewarded, if not necessarily monetarily in terms of psychic rewards, in the society and only basically restricting it to the best and the brightest. Absolutely, and you're, you're talking about Finland, particularly. It is harder to get in Finland, it is harder to get into a school of education than it is into medical school. But what has Finland done? Finland and Scandinavia, the education structures are centralized. What does that mean? The financial apparatus to uh, provide resources is centralized, and, and the distribution is through a centralized apparatus. Some part of the problem in the United States around K through 12 is the fact that there's differential investment based on property taxes in public schooling across the country. So yes, there are many things that have occurred in Scandinavia, and particularly in Finland, and some would argue, well, it's easier in Finland because they're, Scand because they're homogeneous nations and they're taking care of their own. That's less and less the case. It's been only massive amounts of immigration and still the question is, are you a citizen? And if you are a citizen, what, right do you ha what rights do you have? And if you have rights, what's the right to a quality education? So I, yes, clearly. And by the way, if you haven't looked at the spirit level by Pickett, um, and, uh, th there they look at the question of inequality in education and so on, and what the consequences are in relationship to a whole host of other social problems. And it's startling. And one, uh, to go start with you, Joan. I wanted to just quickly build on what Renata was saying before, when she's talking about a student movement on campus and linking that with broader state political efforts. Here on campus, we have a faculty union that often um, uh, fights to get uh, more democratic governance. But we don't have a faculty senate. We have a college council, which only makes advisory recommendations. Um, how can we make this a more democratic uh, institution in which faculty's voice is louder and more powerful? I mean, I th you know, you've named, I think, that are fundamentally the two ways. You have a union that's active, that has a robust agenda, that some part of its agenda is, is clearly about set, you know, faculty benefit salaries and so on, but of equal importance is the quality of the education. Uh, for students because that has to be part of any public union's agenda. But governance is equally important and you can have a governance structure and it can be weak. Um, I've seen it again and again. So the question is building a strong governance structure with, and that includes department chairs as a part of it because department chairs are a very critical component in any kind of uh, effort 
to vitalize or revitalize uh, curriculum and faculty autonomy and democracy. But if you don't have a governance structure, I recommend creating one. I'll give you one quick example. In Queens, at Queen City University of New York, we have 19 campuses, 270,000 students. One of them is at a community, co one com a community college, Queensboro. They resisted pathways. They called, they failed in this, but here's what they did. They had a faculty senate meeting and they rejected it. Then management called another meeting and managed to win the vote by one. Then faculty called a meeting, an all faculty meeting. All fa they never had an all faculty meeting. You need a majority of all faculty. They fell three votes short of an all faculty meeting which would have stopped uh, pathways. But what did they accomplish? They created a much more active group of faculty in relation to curriculum, which goes on to this day. At Brooklyn College, last week, they called an old faculty meeting out of governance, and they, stopped, they all voted overwhelmingly to stop pathways. They got their majority. So it can have a very powerful. Yeah, I have a couple of comments about um, standardized instruction. Um, I call it technical approach. Um, when you, when you do, especially in K-12, you're dealing with a population of the people. Number one has to be there. And there are all different levels, academically, socially, and a bunch of other things. Um, that's something that I see that concerns me, because you're making the assumption that everyone can keep up at a certain standard. Um, what disturbs me about usage, about teachers being judged by their students' accomplishments, is that not every student is there. And especially in the population today, where we have a lot of students that are um, special needs, where these kids are mainstream. When I was in high school in the 70s, they weren't, there. They weren't allowed to be there. They were, in, they were in special schools. So in other words, Teachers in a public classroom have this um, situation they have to deal with. I, I hate to call it a distraction, but by the very nature, these kids take more time. They, don't, they may not be with the rest of the population in the class. Um, large, large classes, like you discussed, are a problem. Um, and what? And, 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 um, You'll have to wrap it up. Yeah, I have to have to you in class two minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so I've got that. But the other thing that I, I mean, that I see when students come here is that kids, people go to college not to be um, to develop as individuals, ideally. And on a foundation level class, yeah, maybe you just you need to teach grammar, for example. But when you're getting the more advanced levels, you're looking for somebody who gives you new insights and we hope you develop your own. That's what disturbs me about that particular trend. Mm -hmm. uh, Complex learning, yeah. right? I mean, to the extent that we're not incorporating Look, part of what you said is, and I'll make this quick, the variability in students uh, is a complex circumstance that requires skilled teachers because you've got to teach to different levels, different capacities. Uh, Critical thinking requires skill, that is to impart it, to produce a pedagogy and a content that enables students to move to critical thinking. That's all about complex curriculum. Where we're moving toward is away from that kind of complexity in relationship to teachers. And the other, there's one more comment about Scandinavia and, their, and what, they do, what they do educationally. Yes, they do great things and they, they definitely screen their candidates for education, um, for their education schools. But they also socially agree what should be taught. That in this country, the fact that we can have a serious conversation about creationism as hard science is amazing to me. And, that, and that's the most obvious example. There are other things, of course, and there are certainly there are groups of people that may feel that some aspects of education are more important than others. But you don't get that in, small, in countries like Scandinavia. They agree what should be taught. There's no question about what should be taught. What makes the foundation of education? That's something else people can do. Well, it's centralized. It's centralized. It's centralized. It's something that with all, when they're always talking about numbers, right. nobody says that. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.